Uh, aloha. aloha. I'm still working on my aloha. Uh, it, it really is an honor to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Gail. And um, I don't recommend spending all your time on social media, but good things can happen on social media. And that's where I met, met Gail, and I'm very thankful that we've uh, developed a great friendship. Uh, I'll spend about 25, 30 minutes uh, just talking a little bit about our research. Uh, I can't go into all the details in the book. Hopefully you guys get one and enjoy it. Um, we wrote it so that it can push uh, the thinking in the sort of conventional development space. And so we're very excited about that. I'll start by just t telling you a little bit about me. Uh, about 19 years ago, I moved to the U.S. I'm not from Ethiopia, I'm from Nigeria. But when I left Nigeria in 2000, I had no intentions of ever going back. Um, think, think of it like this. Like you're in prison for a long time and somebody gives you a, a pass to get out. You don't really think about going back to prison. And that's sort of how I saw uh, Nigeria. There was little to no opportunity. Uh, the schools weren't very good, and you needed connections in order to get anything done. So I was in the United States for eight years. I did not go back home until I read about this 10-year-old uh, girl that you see here. There's a third book I read on economic development, and if you're taking Professor Pooley's class, I'm sure you've read it or you will. You've heard of it or you'll read it. Um, it's called The White Man's Burden. It's written by a professor out of New York University, and he dedicates the book to this girl you see here. At 10 years old, she has to wake up every morning, walk miles, fetch firewood, and then take it to the market in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, to sell. I remember where I was that day, it was February 2008, and I was in my room reading about this, this girl, and I just started sobbing. I had a practice of reading a lot at coffee shops at the time. I was just thankful to God that I was not in a coffee shop reading. <laughs> Imagine you're at a coffee shop doing some work and the guy next to you just starts crying uncontrollably. Um, so thankfully that night I was in my room. Um, but it was that day that I told myself I had to do something. I didn't know what to do, but I began to uh, study more I started an organization called Poverty Stops Here. I worked on that for a bit. Um, I'll cut the long story short. I found myself at Harvard Business School. I was fortunate to get in. And graduated in 2015. And since then, I've been working with Professor Christensen. Now, we took this picture here uh, about six months ago or so. Um, this is when we received the galley copies that I, I sent uh, Gail a copy of. Um, it's not often that I get a chance to talk to a, a group of people who a majority, or I'd say most, have sort of a common faith. Um, and so uh, I just want to encourage you guys a bit. Um, you know, I, I flipped from the second slide to the third slide of this presentation in about two seconds. But between the second slide and the third slide, was about 10 years, right? It was 2008 that I read about the girl, and this picture was taken last year. Now, the reason I say that is um, some of you, well, all of us are on our own journeys, and some of us have a lot of goals. We have a lot of dreams. Uh, and I just want to encourage you because, um, you know, God has big plans for you. And even though things may not seem like, you know, they're gonna, they're happening or things may seem like they're slow, I just want you to know it took 10 years for us to go from me reading about that girl to this picture where we had a, a galley copy of the book. And so whatever you're going through, I want you to stay encouraged. Today, I wanna share with you some ideas in the book. Uh, the first thing, is about theories and management. Uh, Professor Christensen has the most popular course at Harvard Business School. It's called Building and Sustaining a Successful Enterprise. 
Now, he built that course based on a simple idea. He said, you know, God does not, did not give us data about the future. Every piece of data we have is about the past. Yet, we live in a future-oriented world, right? Tomorrow is tomorrow. And we don't have data about tomorrow. Yet, tomorrow is going to come. So he says, instead of thinking about the future with regards to data, how about we think about it based on theories? Now, God has given us the ability to develop theories. And when you think about theories, usually you think about the scientific world, right? you think about the technical fields. But he says, a theory is simply a statement of causality. What causes what to happen and why? And when you begin to think about theories this way, you realize their power and potential. We all use theories in our lives. And so as you start to think about it, you realize managers, investors, students, teachers, all of us are voracious consumers of theory. Because a theory simply says, if I do X, I believe Y is gonna happen. When a manager makes a decision, on a new product to launch, they do that with the belief that that product is gonna sell a certain number of, um, of SKUs or, or copies, right? When an investor makes a decision on what to invest in, he or she does that because you know, they believe that the thing they're investing in is gonna either go up in value or give them a very good return. And so we are all voracious consumers of theories. And when you boil it down, explicit well-researched theories are very valuable. They can tell us about the future, help us predict the future. So I'll share with you some ideas from our book today. The first one is really about the economy. And it's what we try to explain in chapter three of the book. The way we think about the economy is a little bit different. Um, the economy typically is sort of a hodgepodge of stuff. You know, you've got the government, private sector, you've got schools, hospitals, and so on. But I'll use these three concentric circles to explain how we think about the economy. Now, think about the first circle as the wealthiest people in society. Right? These are the people who have access to a lot of things. Uh, the best housing, the best healthcare, the best schools, and so on. There are usually very few of these people in a society. And the second circle describes, you know, people who have less wealth and less access, and they're typically a, a bit more, right, in, in society. And the third are people, uh, the, the vast majority of people in, uh, in a society. And these people typically don't have access to a lot of things. And I think about a country like Nigeria uh, or some of the countries where you're from. Uh, you know that a majority of people, you know, most people in those countries live in that outer concentric circle. In that circle, we say there's a lot of non-consumption. Uh, these are people who, whose lives would be better if they consumed certain things but because of cost, uh, affordability, uh, the skills required to operate the things, um, or just access, they can't consume uh, those, those things. Some are as basic as food, education, healthcare, and others are you know, more exciting things like leisure. Now, the way we define innovation is the ability for an organization or an entrepreneur to democratize access. So the things that all the people in the first concentric circle have access to, if an innovator figures out a way to democratize it and sort of break the bounds of those circles, then we call that a market creating innovation. So I'll give you a quick example. About 50, 60 years ago, computers, and mainframe computers were very expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars, in some cases millions of dollars. Some of them would take up this whole room. 
they required highly technical people to operate them. And so they were only available to the biggest of universities, the biggest of organizations in the world. But we had organizations begin to develop personal computers and we now started to see personal computers in our homes, in many small businesses, small offices. And today, I'm pretty sure everybody in here has a computer in their pocket. You know, we have smartphones now. Who does not have a smartphone? Excellent. All right. Don't be shy. <laughs> um, so, so everybody, right? All, it's almost everybody has a computer in their pockets. Now, the ability for entrepreneurs to democratize that access to make the computer simple and affordable so many more people in society could access it is really how we like to think about the power of an innovation. So with that said, as we were writing this book, we realized the word innovation is, I mean, it's used and abused and everybody, you know, you do anything small or different, it's an innovation. So we said, let's give you a nice taxonomy so that we can better understand what an innovation is. So the first types are market creating innovations. These are innovations that make things simple and affordable so many more people in society could have access. Now these innovations at the core, because by virtue of their creation, they, the organizations that make them make them accessible to many more people, you need many more people to make them, to sell them, to distribute them, to educate the public on how to use them. And these innovations therefore create a lot of jobs, and they enable, enable development. Second type of innovation are innovations that make things, um, existing products better, right? And so if you think, if we stay with the smartphone example, you, you, you have smartphones that were created eight to 10 years ago, and the ones that are created today. We have much nicer cameras, a lot more memory, we have a lot more features in the phones today. It makes good products better. But these innovations are typically targeted at existing customers. And so these, these are customers that can already afford the products. So if you think about the concentric circle again, when you make a sustaining innovation, typically you're targeted at customers in a particular concentric circle you're not really creating access for people outside that circle. They don't really create as many jobs, right? If you think about it, Apple doesn't really need to hire many more engineers if they wanna put a new camera on their phone, right? So that's one way to think about sustaining innovations. They're important and they keep economies and organizations uh, interesting and vibrant and exciting but from a development standpoint, they don't have as much of an impact. And the third type are what we call efficiency innovations. These are innovations that, make you ma that, that enable you to make good products cheaper. Okay, and so think about outsourcing, right? When you take things that you're doing in a particular location and you send them to another location where you get uh, cheaper labor, or you introduce technology that helps you uh, make your processes more efficient. These are what we call efficiency innovations. Now these are interesting because typically they have the impact of eliminating jobs where they are executed, right? Now none of these is bad in and of themselves. Now, what we tried to do was just help people understand these different categories of innovation so that they could understand that they have different impacts on an economy on a, and on an organization. And so with that, we also said, what are some of the characteristics of these types of innovations? So if you think about market creating innovations, typically they require capital, the payback period is a bit longer, and many organizations are not really aligned in the processes are not internally aligned to support these types of innovations because you are literally talking about creating a market that does not yet exist. And so you have to envision a world differently. 
Sustaining innovations, they're different. The internal processes in an organization are, are typically aligned, right? You debate, oh, should we go with this version camera? Should we put this much memory on the, on the phone um, or not? You do market research, you understand how your customers will respond, and then you make those investment decisions. They're easier uh, to get through the hurdle because the market already exists. And efficiency innovations are probably the easiest to get through, primarily because you're essentially going to your manager and you're saying, hey, you know, it costs us $100 to make this product today, but if, you know, if we invest in this particular technology or if we move this operation to a different region, we're going to save 25% of our cost. And so a lot of times, these are the innovations that are most common in many organizations, efficiency innovations. Now, let's shift gears a bit, and let's understand the impact of market-creating innovations. This is one of my favorite slides, and I'm gonna have to ask for some audience participation. Some demographics are gonna be listed on the board. I'm gonna read them out and I'd love for you guys to shout out what countries you think this might represent. So it's a country where about 70% of the people are living in rural areas. Uh, about two in 10 children die before their fifth birthdays. That's infant mortality. 10% electrification. The average household spends over 50% of their income on food. 10% uh, go to secondary school, and life expectancy is a healthy age of 45, which means I'm in my twilight years. Uh, so, so uh, and you know, you're laughing, but some, some of you in the audience are already gone. <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, <laughs> pro, pro, Professor Pooley. <laughs> all right, all right, enough of that, enough of that, all right. Um, what country, what country? Let me get a couple of people, huh? North Korea, okay, let me get two more. India, okay. Cambodia, excellent, excellent. So I love that, I love that. Now you guys, um, I love that because it helps you think about some, some of the countries that this, this could be true today. But these, these stats, these demographics represent demographics from the United States of America. Not today, but about 120 to 150 years ago. Now, the reason I like to show that is I like to remind people that um, the US at one point was an extremely poor country. Life expectancy was 45. And things, things were hard in the US, but not anymore. And the reason I show that is, no matter how hard things might be in India, in North Korea, in Cambodia, there can be a path to development. The path may not look as identical as the path the US took, but there is a path to development, right? Now, how do we get there? That's the question. And I like to show this as well. Now, this is the Henry Ford's Model T. Now, we, we take a look at this, this slide and we see a car, right? But let me remind you, when Henry Ford decided to develop the Model T, cars about 120 years ago, 1908, were like private jets today. Only the rich, the extremely rich, had access to cars. Now, he said, I'm going to make a car for the average American so that they can afford it. Cars cost anywhere between five to $10,000 in, in those days. And those were you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars when you adjust for inflation. So only the wealthiest in society, people in that concentric circle, that tiniest one could afford. He said, I want to make it available to everybody. Investors said, Henry Ford, that's never going to work. Some of them pulled out. We don't have the road infrastructure that's going to help you uh, develop this. Uh, we don't have traffic laws. Uh, the government in, in, in many states in the U.S. were you know, quite corrupt, at least not as uh, transparent as they are today. And so everything was against him, similar to 
uh, in many countries that, that were called out. But he decided to focus on making the car simple and affordable. Now, in order to do that, his innovation pulled in so many other things into society. It enabled farming and agriculture to become more productive in the US. It increased the productivity in education. It enabled people begin to create suburbs because they didn't have to w live as close to where they worked anymore. It triggered significant investment in America's road infrastructure because all of a sudden people had cars and they started clamoring for roads and said, we need more roads. And so you can see the kinds of things that can happen as a result of making products simple and affordable. Now, obviously, this is a car, so it has a significant impact. But the principle is really the same, uh, regardless of what product you make simple and affordable for many people to have access to. Now, uh, last couple of slides, I'll quickly explain um, a difference between what I call push and pull strategies. Because what Ford was able to enable was what we call a pull strategy. He created a market that pulled in so many other things into the economy. Let me contrast that now with what happened to me after I read about that 10-year-old girl. So like I said, I was in, uh, in the US for eight years. I didn't go home. But I read about the girl, and I said, I got to do something about it. I went back home, started Poverty Stops here. And this is one of the first pictures I took when I went to uh, a village in Nigeria. These are women washing clothes by the banks of this river. And I you know, instantly said, the reason they're doing this is because they don't have water in their community. So I know the answer to this. I'm going to go ahead and build a well. So I came back to the US, got some friends together. We got money, and we built a well for the people in the community. And I was excited. Uh, there are a few feelings in the world that make you more excited about like, than, than when you see water gushing out of a well in a place that doesn't have access. But six months later, I get a call. The well broke down. I'm back in the US working, full-time job, and I'm scrambling, trying to figure out how to fix it. Yeah, I fixed it once, fixed it twice, but I, it just was not sustainable. But then I started thinking as we were doing research for this book, even though there was a small organization, it was just me and some friends, I realized this is really how many, many of the projects that I read about operate. You know, because poverty shows itself as a lack of resources. You know, it's a lack of water, so we build wells, we push them. It's a lack of education, so we push schools, right? It's a lack of infrastructure, so we want to push roads and bridges and so on. You know, lack of health care, we push clinics. But we do these things with the best of intentions in communities that don't have access without really understanding how those things are going to remain sustainable in those communities. And that's what I saw we, we, we did as an organization with regards to the wells. And so we stopped building wells because they just kept breaking down. A different strategy, uh, last, last uh, slide here is uh, explained by a pack of noodles. How many people know Indomie noodles? I figure in this crowd I get one or two. Um, so these are just like ramen noodles, but they taste a little better in my opinion. <laughs> taste a little better. Um, so 30 years ago, two brothers, decided to sell Indomie noodles to people in Nigeria. Now, you gotta understand, it's a West African country, it's very poor, under military regime uh, in 1988. Uh, we didn't eat noodles, it wasn't part of our staple food, staple diet. Um, many Nigerians at the time thought noodles were worms, no joke. Uh, think about it. You've never seen that before. Tell, tell me that doesn't look wormy, <laughs> right? Uh, but they said, look, we're not going to focus on the demographics of Nigeria and say they're poor, 80% live on less than $2 a day. Let's figure out how to 
help them, let's build wells and build schools. No, they said, we look at a country that's rapidly urbanizing. People have less time to prepare food. So let's give them something that'd be easy to cook, two, three minutes, and you get food, you add a boiled egg, and, 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 and you, you, you get a nutritious meal for your, for your family. So they were able to do this, and they created a market for noodles. It took some time, but I like to show this because you see a pack of noodles, but look at all the other things that this pack of noodles has pulled into the Nigerian economy over time. They have now invested close to half a billion dollars in the economy. They support about 50,000 jobs, 13 factories, millions of dollars in tax revenue are now being pulled into the economy. And what we found is what they did, the activities that they engaged in were no different than the activities that Henry Ford engaged in in order to create the market for his car. And so, like I said earlier, when you make a product simple and affordable for many people who haven't had access to it, you will reap the benefits. Your organization will. But I think you also engage inadvertently in what we call nation building. You help people have jobs, which gives people a lot of dignity. You provide tax revenues for the government so that they can better provide services uh, for the citizens. And ultimately, you create more prosperity in a country. So I'll, I'll end uh, my presentation on that note. I want to thank you guys for listening. It really is a pleasure and an honor to be here. And we can, uh, we can definitely take some questions. Thank you. So when we were doing the research for this book, one of the things people kept saying is this, this will never work because of corruption, you know, there's a lack of institutions and things like that. And so uh, the third section of the book is titled the barrier section. And we have a chapter specific to corruption. It turns out, you know, when you looked at the demographics in the US, um, there was a time when there was also a lot more overt corruption in the United States, right? But that has evolved, that has changed. And it changed because people now had alternatives to be corrupt, right? If you think about it, when you're a poor person or when you live in a poor community that doesn't give you a lot of opportunities to make money so you could provide for your family, food, health, uh, education, and so on, uh, corruption, becomes a very attractive option. When you create a new market where you have to now hire more people, provide jobs, and you, you enable them, right? You enable them, earn more money so they can now provide these things for their family. Corruption becomes less attractive. So it's certainly a challenge. It's a process. But what we try to explain in the book is it's an evolutionary process that can happen when you provide a viable alternative for people uh, to take care of their problems. So th th this is universal across the board in the sense that when you're looking for investment, 
uh, in countries that are not as, not as attractive as America, Japan, the EU, it will be difficult, right? Uh, if you look at the flows of foreign direct investment, over 70% of foreign direct investment, international money is going into other countries, go to countries that are under the OECD umbrella. So the United States, Western Europe for the most part, South Korea, Japan, right? That's where over 70% of foreign direct investment goes, about 30 or so countries, and there are roughly 200 countries in the world. So I think understanding that is gonna be a challenge. That's number one. It was a challenge for Henry Ford. It was a challenge for a lot of the entrepreneurs we profile, right? So that's number one. Number two, I think part of it is we want to educate the public with this information. We want to educate capital providers so that they can start to see folks like yourself who are trying to build businesses in other countries that don't seem as attractive. Um, we, want to, we want to show them that, you know, it is possible for you to reap significant returns by supporting these entrepreneurs, right? And the third is I will say uh, it's probably more important to know where not to go than to know where to go. So if I were trying to build a business in Nigeria, I'm most likely not going to go for what I would call institutional money. And so this is monies that are tied to people's pension funds, institutional investors, you know, hedge funds or big private equity funds or even big venture capital funds, you will probably get the most success by focusing on either friends and family or your, uh, your networks at the onset. And at the onset, you don't need a significant amount of money. I would say you start small and then over time you build, right? It's when you've proven out a proof of concept then you can go and start to look for institutional dollars. It's, it's in, or, you know, banks and so on. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a tough road, I, I, will, I will be honest, but uh, I think knowing where not to look is as important as knowing where, where to look. Uh, one last question. How do you encourage people to do more Well, um, as I said, I know that last question was going to stump me like this. Uh, it sounds easy. But um, so, so let, let me say a couple of things. The word innovate, if you look at the history of the word, innovation, innovate, it wasn't, historically, it was not a very uh, positive word. It didn't have a positive connotation. In a, in a, in innovators, the innovation, they were s sort of the weirdos. And when you think about it, it made sense. We were coming from a lot of aristocratic environments. And so what was of value was, you know, what family were you born into, right? And that's sort of what gave you meaning and value. Now, I think the way to encourage entrepreneurship is helping people understand the role of entrepreneurship in nation building. See, entrepreneurship isn't that thing that just happens on the side. It's a cute thing. You know, you really get a job, but entrepreneurship is sort of a nice to have. No. Entrepreneurship is really what drives economies. Look at the wealthiest countries today. They're the countries that have people who build and create stuff. You know, you go back 50, 60 years ago, you know, you go down the street to the PCC, that's entrepreneurship. That's somebody thinking, we can create a lot of value. We can create something out of nothing. Even this school is entrepreneurship because there was nothing here. People envisioned we can create an institution, provide value to people, educates people, helps them become better. And, 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 and so, helping people understand what entrepreneurship is and the value it provides in an economy, I think is probably the best way to encourage more entrepreneurship. Thank you. <laughs>